Thank you, Selena. Mm. That idea, that imagery of um, a telegram is amazing. I never thought about that one before, but the amount of times, I, you know, as I was listening to you talk, Selena, the amount of times in life that uh, don't we wish we would just get a telegram with good news? So many times in our lives where we're just uh, desperate for good news, and I love that imagery of the telegram, which is really so beautifully uh, sets us up for what Christmas is, and particularly this Advent season as we prepare. We continually are getting telegrams um, that really talk about um, the spiritual good news for our lives. Yeah, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm just trying to work out how to lower this a little bit. All right, so this is, um, so there's no Sunday school or anything like that for you guys. You're really supposed to leave at about this point because um, this is going to be the very scary Christmas sermon, which is not G-rated or PG-rated or even M-rated. This is R-rated. Very scary. Christmas is scary, and, and what I wanted to do was to um, freak you guys out from the very beginning. And uh, I can do that because you're human beings just like I am, and you are easily frightened. Easily frightened. If I stood here and just waited quietly and then just let out with the biggest yell, three or four of you would actually jump. Do you believe me? But you know I'm going to do it, right? You know it's coming, but being human, some of you will react. Some of you will react outwardly with a little bit of a yell. Some of you will react with a little bit of a jump, maybe both. If you don't react physically on the outside, you might react on the inside. Your body might be doing things that you can lie about, like getting sweaty palms or whatever. Are you getting sweaty palms now? Because you know I'm going to do this, right? Okay. No, I won't do that. But, <laughs> well, I might. Just halfway through the sermon, you won't know it's coming, all right? So it's, but Christmas is scary. Now, the reason I'm doing the whole Christmas is scary thing is because I'm a college pastor, and I've got to work out somehow of connecting Christmas with the spiritual theme for our college this year, which is change, okay? And so as I was trying to think about how I can connect uh, change and Christmas is, you know, change can be a very frightening thing for human beings. In the same way, in the same way, sometimes it's just our reaction will be outwards because it's probably something that affects uh, the world around us in a very physical way. Sometimes it's deeper than that. Sometimes it's like something that frightens us on the inside. Perhaps it's something that frightens us, not just individually, but maybe communally. Okay? We all get to freak out together. It's like if I just yelled out right now, everybody jumps. I wonder if that would happen. About five or ten minutes away, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Christmas is scary, and I want to prove that to you this morning, but I want to ask you first the other side of it. Christmas, surely, as Christians at least, but not only as Christians, I think most people in the world love Christmas. Um, what's exciting about Christmas? If you had a Christmas box with a little bow on top under the Christmas tree, and they had a little thing on there saying, the most exciting Christmas present ever. And don't say Jesus, okay? What would it be? What's exciting about Christmas? Forget the thing inside as being uh, something disconnected from Christmas. What's exciting? What's it gonna excite you about Christmas? You can't give me a spiritual answer. I love it when a young person puts their hand up. That's so good. Getting something new. Yeah, yeah, there's change. All right, didn't have it before. Now I'm getting it. Wow. That's good. Exciting. Come on. How old are you? 
14. Come on, guys. 14-year-olds. By the way, you've got to come to Cornerstone College because the 14-year-olds up there won't put their hand up. What else? Anticipation? What do you mean? You don't know what's inside, so it's a surprise. It's, you know. Okay, so Christmas, unwrapping presents, exciting. So you're a present person. You love getting presents. Actually, I like giving them all. Oh, here we go. Here we go. You change your story now, don't you? Eh? Hey, I like unwrapping them. Oh, no, no, I like giving them. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? All right, forget it. Let's flip it. All right, it's, can Christmas be a scary time? What freaks you out most about Christmas? And sure, oh, all the hands. I was going to say, surely nobody will have anything to say here because we're all Christians and it's a good time. Yes. The food. The food. the food. Right. Everyone's happy. I don't have to get any food, right? <laughs> I get to eat the food. <laughs> How many people do you have coming? Twelve people, and you've got to get all of that right. And uh, now, twice. What's your name? Riley. 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 What is scary about Christmas? The passion of the craft movie. Oh, wow. Did you, do you have to watch that every Christmas? That's 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 extreme. That's extreme. I went to see that movie at the pictures in 2003, and I've never watched it again. And I'm a pastor. That's a scary film. Yeah, good answer, Riley. What else is scary about Christmas? When you get scary presents, you could freak out. <laughs> <laughs> What's the scariest present? Yes! That's what I'm trying to say, but he's not supposed to know that. What is scary? What scary present have you ever got? Come on. Have you ever opened up and it's just like, ah! No? Uh, no. But I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I'll leave a bit of space there because what a great answer. Yeah, scary. Scary for them. Scary for them. Yeah. And it just makes me think too. Um, all the people around the world at Christmas time who um, are just living in poverty and uh, don't get to appreciate that time in the same way perhaps that we do. Um, yeah, very scary. Very good. The story of Christmas, if we think about the stories that was taught to us growing up and as we continue to share with our children is a good one. Um, it is rated G at the very worst, perhaps PG. You know, it's got a donkey and uh, it's got Joseph and Mary. Now Mary's pretty young apparently. Um, she's betrothed but Joseph is kind of looking at her thinking, how come you're pregnant? And uh, he's freaking out and uh, throws her on the donkey and gets the hell out of town. Um, so there's a bit of fear around the place. If I take the nativity story movie, now there's a scary movie, um, seriously, like in terms of literally um, the way in which the father of Mary... Uh, is freaking out. That could be pretty, pretty scary. But it's got other really cool things like the wise men and the gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh and you've got the little baby Jesus himself and it's like a baby. Like, there's nothing scary about a baby, right? Um, sure, you know, when they got to Bethlehem, it was going to be a bit of a, I don't know, different kind of labour and birth. There was nowhere for them. That would have been pretty scary. But the word, the scripture doesn't actually, I don't think, probably have to go back and just double check myself there, but it doesn't say that any of those things freak them out. Now, Christmas is a pretty chilled story, except one bit, which is the bit that I'm thinking of. 
which is the scariest bit in the Christmas story. There were some shepherds out in the field at night time, taking care of their sheepies and their lambies, and something happened. And whatever it was, it absolutely terrified them full stop. Completely freaked them out. And I just thought, yeah, okay, so here's Christmas. Here's a story that does engage us with the idea that human beings can be freaked out. It had to do with lights and angels and the glory of God. And however we might want to interpret why it was that the shepherds were freaking out. But something was happening. Something that was, wasn't going to be a was anymore. Something was happening in that moment. And I know that it's easy for us to look at that text or those verses or those words and say, well, it was just, you know, whatever was in the sky or, you know, that's what scared them. I mean, I don't know what it would be like to, come face to face with an angel. It hasn't happened to me. I don't think if it's even happened to me in a dream. Has anybody met an angel in a dream? Not me. So I don't know how scary that would be. But for them, the text says it was really scary. But I like to think of the bigger picture here, that in the middle, it's almost in the middle, in the middle of the story of the birth of the Messiah, is this moment where people are just freaking out. And I like to connect that to the idea that what scares human beings, not the most, oh, by the way, what scares us the most? The unknown. The unknown. Yeah. Yeah. The spider. The spider. Yeah, what's that called? That's, uh, yeah. Now, that is true. I think when it comes to phobias, I think that's right up there. There's no spiders in the Jesus story. Um, number two, oh, come on. Christian people, what scares us? In this life, dying, yes. Number two, out of control. That's got to be there somewhere. Dying is number two. Number three is the one I'm going to talk about for just a moment, and that's change. We don't like change. Number one is public speaking. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> change. Change is scary. Christmas is scary. Um, when it comes to how human beings respond to change, it can get pretty crazy. I, I just wonder that in your own lives, even if just, just one moment, one of the biggest changes that you've ever had to experience, and whether or not in the midst of that experience you would have felt both physical and mental and emotional angst. I'm not talking about a jump scare. I'm talking about the things that happen in our lives to take us from what was to what will be. Um, my wife isn't really good at change at all, and we've been married for 30 years, and she admits to that, but it's a bit crazy with her because, like, I'm a, I don't know what I am, but I know that I'm a furniture shifter. <laughs> I know, it's weird. I know. Listen, we all have our problems. We all have addictions. We all have things that are just really weird. And for the most time, we can sort of hide them from the world. When you're married, though, and you live in the same house, my thing with moving furniture gets me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and I had a bit of time recently. Um, and we were going to buy a new lounge, and I was thinking through, you know, when we get the lounge, you know, this needs to be over here. And I waited for her to go to work. Uh, she's a midwife, so she works sometimes on the weekend. And I just completely changed, like, four rooms in the house. 
Yeah. Now, you see your eyes? Yeah. What? What? Why would you do that? Exactly. Why? Change. Change. We can't even deal with changing where a chair is. And then we go, oh, what are you talking about, Pastor Albert? You know, we can deal with change. She came home, waited for me to leave, <laughs> didn't say anything, realised she couldn't move it all back because I'd probably come back and move it all again. But she took the clock that I'd moved. I moved a clock. What? Who does that? I do. <laughs> she took the clock and put it back where it was, and that was her protest. She couldn't deal with, you know, the whole thing, but she moved the clock back. Furniture. But there are so many more big things in our lives than just shifting furniture, and they all are really hard for human beings to deal with. And they're just the simple things. But what about when it becomes something a little more deeper, something that really kind of changes or has the capacity to change your identity? But the things that you believe, the things that you value, the ethics that you hold, those things that you've grown up with, and as you become an adult in life, you've kind of been formed to believe certain things, whether it's spiritual or whether it's related to relationships and family and marriage, or whether it's some other ethical issue, whether it's got to do with things like abortion or euthanasia, or matters pertaining to uh, sexual identity, or a host of other things. Even, dare I say, and I'll only say this once, and I'm not trying to be political, but just make the point that the change thing is a bit weird for us, is the whole COVID thing and the way in which we react to, you know, what's freedom and what's not freedom. And I'm not making a point here. Don't throw any heavy things at me right now. All I'm saying is as human beings, it drives us nuts. Our ethics, the idea that they might be changed and that somebody might be trying to talk us into another way of being or thinking or relating or working is really, really hard for us. And so you've got all of the simple things and then you've got those more deeper things in our lives that are asked to maybe be changed and we can't deal with it. And then there are the times, especially for those of you who work in places that have lots of people, you know, that the professional changes or the or the, um, the communal changes, the idea that any particular group of people now aren't just changing individually or being asked to change, but a whole group of people are being asked to change. How hard is that? Just you are members of the LCA, hey? So again, I'm not gonna be political here, I'm not, but I wanna make a point that the whole women's ordination thing, which I'm not making a point about, started in 1987. We sorted that one out, maybe, you know, I don't know, what's that, four decades? I don't know. All right, as a body of people, it's hard work. You know, the idea of changing from what was to what is, and I'm not saying that there aren't good reasons for not changing, I'm just saying it's hard work. And yet life goes on and we sit in our angst and our worry and we try and avoid those times in our lives where we've been asked to change. And yet here's a thing that I've discovered about Christian people is that whilst our humanity is common to all people who don't have the same belief as us, yet we would point the finger to them and say, hey, you need to change. Dun, dun, dun. Right? We don't like to change. We find it hard. 
Sure, we say change is a good thing. Just don't talk to me about me changing. But we say to others, and, I, and this is the thing that I've learnt more than anything else as a school pastor, because my congregation ain't Christian. Hmm. Just thinking about. So I'm sure as a sending congregation or as people of a church who send me to the school, I've got to base I've got to go and tell them to change, right? Or what? Yeah. Scary. Scary. Shepherds were scared. Hmm. Christmas. Christmas gifts. A box underneath the tree. And it's labelled as change. And we think to ourselves, but we've changed. Why do I need a gift as boring and as pointless as a gift like that? But you kind of, you're polite because this gift comes from God. You don't want to upset God at Christmas. So you politely say thank you. And you open the box. What do you find? Bit of a cliche. But what do you find in the box? I've forgotten your name now. Riley, what do you find in the box? What's in the box, man? At Christmas time. Yeah. It's a cliche. Okay. But it's not. It's not a cliche. It's Christmas. Um, and here's the difference. See, the gift, as scary as it might be to open, is the very gift that says, you don't have to change. You don't need to be afraid. You think about what the angels said to the shepherds. Don't be afraid. If you think about this little child in the box, grows up, finds himself in a moment that's really scary with his disciple out on the lake. And he says, don't be afraid. And then towards the end of his life, or right at the end of his life, He's hung on a cross. And he uses different words. Okay? He says, it's finished. Which is code. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. This idea that the Christmas gift that comes from God and is boxed and ready to be opened, is the gift that is already there. It is the gift that has been given to you before you even knew there was a box to be opened. It demands nothing of you except for you to recognise the gift that it is. The total and complete unconditional love and grace of God. And yes, sounds like a cliche. And yes, as good Lutherans will say, woohoo! I knew you were going to say something like that, Pastor. It's a cliche.
great gift. Before I say the next thing, I want you to know that that gift is yours. Okay? And the idea that you need to change for God, all right, comes with knowing that he's already taken all of that to the cross. But here's the scariest thing of all, as Lutherans and as Christians all around the world, okay? The box is opened for us, and it's so scary, we don't want it. I work in a place where there's lots of kids who obviously come from non-Christian backgrounds, um, don't go to church, don't have a faith background at all, and are quite upfront about telling me, you know, this Jesus stuff, you can have it. And when I say to my community and share with them the unconditional love and grace of God, it isn't them who say, I don't want that. It's already given. But it's those that perhaps I work with from time to time who say, you're giving them too much. You're giving them too much. The scary thing to give it all. That's Christmas. It's in the box. May you unwrap that box again this Christmas time. May the love and the joy and the peace and the hope of the child inside be yours to keep. Amen. Heavenly Father, it is Advent time. We give you thanks for the gift that it is that we can prepare in these weeks leading up to Christmas. Lord, open our hearts to the reality of the gift of Christ being everything, totally unconditional. May we continue to live in that reality and to share that reality. Lord, we pray all of this in his name.